Welcome to our worship service this morning at the Cathedral Church of All Saints in Halifax. My name is Heather McCants and I am filling in this morning for our rector and Dean Paul, who is taking a week off this week. We are glad that you will be worshiping with us. The service you will find on the Cathedral's website as you follow along. One announcement of upcoming events you will see uh, for those who have the bulletin that this coming Saturday is the Halifax Pride Parade and there is a group of proud Anglicans who will be walking as part of that event and if you would like more information about that uh, you can find that on the diocesan website. We will begin now by acknowledging where we gather we acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which, which Mi'kmaq and Wallastquik people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wallastquik title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Our worship will begin with the hymn in the blue hymn books at your seats, number 380.
We turn now to the service bulletin to page three. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you and we give you thanks. We praise you for your Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of God. Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand. will join in the collect of the day in the leaflet. Together we pray. God of the prophets, whose word cuts through the webs of power and holds the tyrant to account, be with all who raise their voice against oppression and misrule, who are imprisoned and abused for freedom's sake. Help us to stand and speak with them and witness to your kingdom now through Jesus Christ, the name above all others. Amen. We'll be seated for the first reading. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, in Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. We will now read responsively a portion of Psalm 85. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, 
and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. God of grace, you loved the world so much that you gave your only son to be our savior. Help us to rejoice in our salvation by showing mercy and truth and by walking in the way of righteousness and peace. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Our gradual hymn is number 577 in the Blue Hymn Book. be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. <clears throat> King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, 
it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of Christ. May only the truth be spoken here, and may only the truth be heard. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Please be seated. Herod Antipas was brash and vain, perhaps even a narcissist. He was incredibly ambitious, always trying to get more. More power, more admiration. He desired that people call him a king, even though he really wasn't. He was technically a tetrarch. He ruled a quarter of his father's kingdom. He had divorced his first wife, which in and of itself was already against the Jewish laws of the day, although obeying laws really didn't seem to matter that much to him. He then had his sister-in-law divorce his brother so that they could marry. Antipas figured he was the ruler, so the laws didn't really apply to him and the people around him tended to back him up. He had a tendency to speak without thinking things through, as we heard in today's Gospel reading, when he promised his stepdaughter whatever she wanted just because she had danced well. According to historians of the time, Antipas was paranoid, always thinking everyone was out to get him. He was vain, loved to keep people around him who would tell him how wonderful he was. And here he was throwing a birthday party for himself, forcing all his courtiers and generals to come and celebrate him. It would be easy to think of stories like the one we just heard as happening way in the distant past. But when you think of political leaders around the globe today, we know of such people. Vain, ambitious, power hungry, thinking that they are above the law simply because they are rulers. And it's important for us to know what kind of leader Herod Antipas was if we are to understand the tragedy of the death of John the Baptist. 
because I believe it helps us to understand the climate of fear and suspicion that surrounded John and Jesus and their disciples. Not only were they under occupation from Rome, taxed to pay for the armies that were oppressing them, not only did they have to pay extra taxes in order to worship the one true God, rather than worshiping the emperor and all the gods of Rome, not only were their own religious leaders inclined to a strict letter of the law interpretation that generally left out anyone who was female, anyone with a disability, anyone who wasn't born a healthy Jewish male, they were also living closer to home with this volatile, unpredictable leader with nearly dictatorial power so long as he paid appropriate tribute to the distant emperor. I used to live in Winnipeg, where my family and I had a membership at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And if you ever head that way, I cannot recommend a visit to the Human Rights Museum highly enough. A few years ago, I went to an exhibit highlighting the life and work of former South African President Nelson Mandela. The exhibit told Mandela's story from his participating in peaceful protests as a young university student through the days of increased violence and persecution of blacks in apartheid South Africa to his arrest and imprisonment, to his final release and election as president of the nation that had once persecuted him. It was an incredibly powerful day, especially the recreation in the museum of Mandela's Robben Island prison cell, where museum visitors were invited to come in and imagine living all of one's life in this small space. Of course, there was never any guarantee for Mandela. He might well have died in prison, as so many of his fellow anti-apartheid comrades did. Now, they were never killed by the white guards. No, 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 no. They tripped and fell down the stairs. They hung themselves. They slipped on a bar of soap in the shower and fell and hit their heads and died. These were the stories their families we're told. That could have been Mandela. Neither he nor any of his supporters really had any reason to imagine a future that would be any different. I wonder what John the Baptist thought would become of him, languishing in Herod's prison for calling out the ruler for breaking God's laws. No, you do not get to divorce your wife, get your sister-in-law to divorce your brother, and then marry her. You are not above the law. You are no better than the rest of us. I suspect this was a last straw, for there were other injustices that John had also called out, calling on tax collectors and soldiers who worked for Herod to stop extorting money from the people, a way of life that Herod and the rest of the officials of the empire encouraged. And of course, simply causing large gatherings of people out in the wilderness and saying potentially revolutionary things was threatening to the paranoid ruler. So arrested and imprisoned and wondering what would happen. But I suspect he never thought his death would come because Herod Antipas got drunk enough at his birthday party that he made a stupid promise to his stepdaughter. The randomness, the pointlessness of it, if anything, seems to me to be an even greater tragedy. Did you catch, though, the first line of the reading? Herod heard of it. Don't you love when we hear in church readings that start like that? Because you don't have a Bible in front of you necessarily to flip back and say, heard of what? So I'll tell you. This is the story 
that comes just before that Jesus sent out his disciples two by two to go out and preach the good news. They were to take no extra tunic or pair of sandals, no purse or bag or even bread for their journey. And Herod heard of it? From his luxurious palace, surrounded by wealth and privilege, Herod heard about this small group of simple people going out to spread a message about God's love. And then we get this story, which is kind of a flashback, because Jesus and his disciples knew already that this had happened. They knew about John's arrest and execution. There may not have been evening news in first century Palestine, but word about events like this still spread. They knew about Herod, and they knew about John's execution, they knew they were living under an erratic, impetuous, and frighteningly powerful dictator. They knew the risk, and they kept on doing the work anyway. Jesus and his followers could have chosen to back away, to keep quiet, to not offend anyone, and to be safe. They did not. They went out into the world to spread the news of God's love and justice and peace and joy. This kingdom of God, this empire that was an alternative to the empire of Rome, that had always been meant for all of God's people. Just as John had proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of God has come near, Jesus and his disciples took up the call. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Turn your life around. Believe in the good news. Even knowing that Herod was going to be threatened by this, again, they went. Even knowing that they might well be risking their lives, they went into a world where the powers that be would silence them, shut down their message, they went. And they brought God's love and justice and healing to people who needed it. Now our world, here in Canada anyway, isn't as threatening as Herod's. We aren't risking our lives to bring God's love to our friends, our neighborhoods, our workplaces. We aren't risking beheading when we call for justice in this world. And yet many of us shy away from doing it, seeking to be inoffensive, to be nice. The witness of John the Baptist, the witness of Jesus and his first disciples, calls us to be bolder. We are called to nothing less than the proclamation in our words and in our lives that the kingdom of God has come near. That God's reign of love and justice and peace is more powerful than the reign of the powers of this world. That we were all created beloved by God and that it is God's will to restore all of creation in that love. The systems of power will resist. The forces of evil will resist. They always do. Because justice and love challenge that power. But as followers of Jesus, we will go out and strive to live out this good news, whatever the risk. Amen. Our service will continue in the leaflet, the service leaflet on page five. I invite you to stand as you are able for the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God.
We hold up in prayer today Linda, our primate, Sandra, our bishop, Paul, our dean and rector, Heather, our celebrant, Helen, our retired priest, Ray and Maggie, our deacons, Heather, our retired deacon, Zach and Jackie, our wardens, Mayanne, our warden in Meritus, Russ, Pauline, Nicholas, and Paul, our music leaders, all who make music in this place, and all who serve here according to their various callings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the wider world, we pray for all who live in areas of conflict, especially remembering the people of Ukraine, Gaza, and Yemen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are ill or in any special need, remembering at this time Richard, Joyce, Bob, George, Shirley, Janet, Marilyn, Philip, Carol Ann, Leslie, Eileen, Padre AJ, April, Innes, Darlene, Edgar, Kelly, Jim, Wilma, Baisley, Paulette, Michael, Bernie, Randy, Ronald, Elizabeth, Isabel, Francis and family, and Nicole. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have recently died, remembering at this time Clay Covey Duck and Elaine Russo. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all dealing with the aftermaths of wildfires, floods, and hurricanes, particularly remembering those who were affected by Hurricane Beryl. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are traveling at this time that they may return home safely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace with justice and mercy throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you will encourage us to be your hands and feet in the world, that we may serve others and love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. On page five in the service booklet. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we can... Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Our hymn at the preparation is hymn number 587 in the Blue Hymn Book.
We continue in the service booklet on page six with the prayer over the gifts. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts so that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to thank you and praise you, holy and gracious God, creator of all things, ruler of heaven and earth, sustainer of life. For you are the source of all goodness, rich in mercy and abounding in love. You are faithful to your people in every generation and your word endures forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with the fellowship of saints and the company of heaven, we glorify your holy name, evermore praising you and singing. We praise you, merciful Father, not as we ought, but as we are able, because in your tender love you gave the world your only Son in order that the world might be saved through him. He made you known by taking the form of a servant, healing the sick, liberating the oppressed, reaching out to the lost. Betrayed, reviled, and nailed to the cross, he confronted the power of sin and disarmed it forever. In his offering of himself, he became the perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Redeemed by Christ, we have been adopted as your children. By your pardon, you have made us worthy to praise you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. In obedience to him and with grateful hearts, we approach your holy table, remembering our Savior's sacrifice and rejoicing in his victory. Confident in his sovereign purpose, we declare our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Send your Holy Spirit on us, that as we receive this bread and this cup, we may partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. May we be renewed in his risen life 
filled with love and strengthened in our will to serve others. And make of our lives, we pray, a pure and holy sacrifice acceptable to you, knitting us together as one in your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Look, the body of Christ is broken for the life of the world. Jesus Christ coming to us in bread and wine. The gifts of God for the people of God.
We turn now in the service booklet to page 10 for the prayer after communion, and I invite you to stand for prayer as you are able. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this meal, you have drawn us to your heart and nourished us at your table with food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and evermore through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. As you have been fed at this table, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give, as you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing which you have received from God, Creator, Son, and Spirit, go with you this day and evermore. Amen. Our sending hymn in the Blue Hymn Book is number 467. <laughs> 